Welcome, fellow citizens. Uh, Larry Platt back here. Uh, and again, trying something different instead of me just uh, writing my outrage and putting everyone to sleep yet again this week, I, I wanted to reach out to uh, have some conversations about where we go from here after the, the um, jury verdict in the first of the Doherty trials. Uh, people forget the second one, the embezzlement one, uh, that was the slam dunk one because that's just that's just a case of like did you take the money or not uh and so uh there's going to be more stuff to come for old old uh, johnny doc and for us so i'm joined by councilwoman uh, uh maria quinoa sanchez uh and and uh, state representative uh jared solomon um you guys are first of all thank you for for being with us um Secondly, uh, you guys are what passes for profiles in courage in Philadelphia, because because <laughs> you're the after the the uh, verdict of con convicting Johnny Doc and Councilman uh, uh, Heenan of corruption, you're the only voices out there uh, with any sort of moral clarity about this moment that we're in. Um, I. I want to ask you about that. Before I do, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, acknowledge, Councilwoman, your lovely moving op-ed in the Inquirer about your battle with breast cancer. It was really inspiring, and I think it took a lot of courage. Uh, so I want to congratulate you on that, on coming forward, and ask you uh, how you're doing. I'm excellent. Uh, always had a great appreciation for the Eds and Meds in Philadelphia. Now I've experienced firsthand how very lucky we are in the city of Philadelphia to have such access. Obviously, I'm blessed and privileged. I have good health care coverage, um, has some of the best surgeons and felt very strongly during, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month as I went to many events with so many brave survivors doing outreach and community service. You know, originally I thought I was going to wait till after I was in the rear view mirror, but I just couldn't go through the month and, and watch all these, you know, wonderful women without coming forward. And the response has been tremendous, um, you know, from colleagues to friends to folks who had, you know, because of COVID similar to me had delayed appointments. So, um, very good uh, outpouring. One in eight women is going to be faced with some form of breast cancer. So this is really important. And, you know, uh, when I'm at the end of, of this journey, really look forward to being a good advocate around some of the science behind this, but also some of the decision making and culturally for Black women and women and Latina women, the kind of decisions we have to make when, when we are faced with this kind of diagnosis is quite complicated. Um, and I've been very lucky to have a supportive husband and children, but not everybody has the village that I have. And, and I want to make sure that the women feel protected and that they're not alone. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And I, as you know, I long ago to, uh, called you uh, Philadelphia's preeminent political badass. And so- Like my title, I use it all the time. <laughs> Larry said I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, if, if anyone was up for this, for this fight, it's, it's you. Um, and that's a good segue into our political moment because uh, you and Jared have been fighting uh, uh, corruption and uh, fighting the good fight for good government for a while. This isn't just in the aftermath of the Doherty verdict. You both have taken on the sort of insider culture of Philadelphia politics for your whole career. So let's begin with me asking both of you, um, why, the, why are you the only two voices out there? Why, why the silence among uh, elected officials and for that matter, uh, civic leaders? Jared, what's, what's going on here? Well, thank you. And it's really uh, an honor to be here with the councilwoman. She, she's really been the trailblazer on this issue. Um, uh, she's been out there consistently pounding the drum, developing a narrative about the importance of good governance in the city of Philadelphia. I, I think it's just kind of the brass tacks, Larry, of, of politics, right? What drives our politics, what is the currency of our politics, it's, it's money. And if you look around council, if you look at all of our judges, if you look at all of our elected leaders at the state, 
they are driven by uh, an addiction to local 98 dollars. And so what we need to do is develop policies that will lessen the impact and hopefully by doing that, give people the ability to free themselves of the yoke of some of these players that are bad for our city and state. Councilwoman, is it just the addiction to money or is it also that the fear of in this town of being labeled in an ad anti-union? Well, you know, and I, and I push back around some of the narrative around this, you know, there have always been in council very active pro-union um, members of council representing constituency, you know, for someone, you know, I've worked very closely with SEIU and Unite, you know, our fights at the airport. So this notion that you need to be on someone's payroll, you know, and directly tied in as, you know, Local 98, all of you know, you know I replaced Rick Mariano in this seat after some corruption, and he was a 98 member, and the Local 98 felt they owned the seat, and I guess then they went to the Sixth Council and, and got that seat, so I pushed back on that, but, you know, what really worries me, and, and, and you know, Representative Solomon and I represent some geographies together, is the Philly shrug around it, which is like, hey, this is Philly, you know, it's kind of our sportsmanship, right? When you're on top, everybody loves you. But when, when we're down, it's everybody's like, oh. Um, and, you know, you're, we're not listening to people. You know, this is reflected in our turnout, our low turnout. And we lose the public vote and the confidence in, in our service. And this is really, really serious work. So, you know, that's what I'm outraged around, that I, we don't have enough colleagues outraged at the fact that this is not what we get into public service to do. I, th that's a great point, uh, the, the lack of a narrative of outrage, because uh, when you go through the list, we, we started publishing Philly corruption all-star like trading cards, you can trade them with your friends, and there's, there's you go back decades, you go back centuries really, uh, so there is something in the, in the, in the water or water, uh, as, as we say, and, and there, there, there is this Philly Shrug is a, is, a, is a great way to explain it. And we saw an example of that with the mayor's comments after the conviction. I have a different opinion uh, from the jury. So after a jury verdict, it is no longer a matter of opinion. It's fact. It's, legal scholars uh, you know, are not necessary. You know, conviction is a conviction, a jury of your peers. What, you know, what better uh, a situation? And everybody's entitled, obviously, to their appeal process. But I think that that just feeds the narrative that this stuff is okay. And it's not okay. You know, in districts like mine, where we have such a low voter participation, folks always ask me, there's like, you have some of the most challenging districts, people don't participate, because they have seen so much, and they've lived so much. I mean, we're going back to Janati in, in District 7. We're going back to the Bruce Mark Simpson stuff. You know, we're going back to you know, the, the stuff with Rick Mariano, who, you know, who, you know, personally has said to me, this is a problem and we have to cut this, this ties and public service will not be taken serious in districts underrepresented like mines because of this attitude that, that we have. And then when you see other parts of the city, nobody else outraged, why will people in my district think that their vote will matter and will change mm -hmm. things? That's an important point, linking it to, to the paucity of voter turnout. We've, we've created apathy and, and cynicism by, by shrugging at this. Um, uh, how, Jared, how do you, before we get to specific reforms that I really want to pick your brains about, um, how do we get the average voter to care about this when it seems like it doesn't, doesn't affect them personally? I happen to believe it does. I happen to believe that every voter pays a de facto corruption tax. Uh, we've got to figure out what that is, I think. Get some data people to figure out what, what we're paying in corruption taxes. But how do we go about getting, getting our constituents, your constituents, to care about this? I, I think it really, Larry, it, it does matter because, I mean, if you look at the mayor's comments, um, and it, it's certainly no profile and courage uh, how he addressed the ongoing uh, pernicious effect of corruption in our city. But it goes to, right, if you're trying to deal with racial equity issues, um, gun violence, educational attainment issues, that requires courage. 
And at a very, very base level, courage is something that you just need to show and prove. And this is that moment. And I think that's what I, I believe Philadelphians do understand. But if, there, if, if this issue continues to be amplified, they'll understand even more, which is that courage is something that is threaded through all of these issues. It's a common element. And if you're not going to be consistent, we're not going to really get to the legacy issues that plague our city. So we as Philadelphians need to continue demand to demand more in terms of accountability, political integrity, and courage in order for us to receive more back. That's a good point. It, it, like Corruption keeps us from doing every part of the agenda we elect people to do because it's this other game. It really is. There, there are there are, and I think this is more than most cities. There are two Philadelphias. There's the insider Philadelphia, and then there's the rest of us. Is that right? That is right. And I think part of the challenge that we have, you know, uh, Representative Solomon talks about courage and also leadership, right? People, in, you know, they give you a vote of confidence so that you can provide leadership and tell them the truth, right? And be transparent. And sometimes you have to make decisions that people don't understand, but if you, you speak to, to it, and you're transparent about it, then you can at least give it a context. We don't even do that, right? We say one thing and do completely the opposite. You know, we talk about equity and yet we put our money in the same places. You know, the, the violent situation in the city, the educational issues, education is important, but we continue to underfund. Violence is important, but we won't say we need a state of emergency, all hands on deck. Like you still have this tripping of, words and terminology. And this is a moment in it, given COVID and all we live, given the social unrest, this is, there's, we're at an intersection in this city where we still have the possibility being more affordable, a day's drive from a third of the country. Like we still have so many positive attributes, but this stuff drags us down. It just demoralizes everything. It's like, you know, when you lose the Eagles game the next day, that Monday look that everybody sees on the train. And that's what we're living. That's what this case does. It just, people who want to get in public service and believe, you see it on social media, right? You see all of the attitudes and, and the folks just writing all of this stuff. And we have to listen to our constituents. Our constituents are tired and they're sick and tired of being tired of us not standing up for them. I love the I love the Eagles analogy. It's so apt, so apt, um, and and it is amazing how after a win, uh, everyone's you can tell the bounce in the step of the city. Um, uh, Representative Solomon, you had an op-ed in the Enquirer with uh, uh, David Thornburg and Khalifa Lee about uh, specific reforms we should adopt. What what are they? So yeah, and I, I think at at, at um, base we're calling for a cultural shift in Philadelphia. And that is something that is going to take time and, and a lot of voices to continue to push a message, a consistent message of reform and be relentless in pushing that message. I think in, in terms of the reforms that we're calling for, um, they're very much uh, in response to what was on full display at the trial. So I think we need one to create, uh, and the councilwoman has been out front in this, left, out, uh, left and right limits, parameters around outside employment. So if you have out outside employment, let's really make those requirements stringent for employers to report to us about what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it, and who you're meeting with. Uh, secondly, let's make sure our independent expenditures, we see the uh, corrosive impact of big money in politics. Let's at least make sure we have almost um, immediate reporting of those entities that are pushing money towards independ independent expenditures so that we create transparency. And lastly, let's talk about whether there's something similar to what we, what we see in New York, where we can do some public financing of election. So if a citizen gives five or $10, we can maybe add a component of that at the city and state level 
So we really provide them with more access to our democratic process. Councilwoman, do you have uh, uh, ideas to add to that or commentary on? Yeah, we've had we've had hearings in council of work around public financing, and you know the administration pushed back even when we had a four hundred million dollars surplus prior to COVID. Really pushed back on public financing, which um, for us was a disappointment because we really did think that this administration would embrace public financing. So that issue continues to be pushed in council. So I totally agree on that. I had been working on outside employment for a while. While um, you know, I, I take this job very, very seriously, and I've watched you know in council um, many folks um, during to particular votes, you know, having to abstain in votes because of their employment, and then I've watched you know, my colleague Heenan be very, very aggressive, you know, sometimes in pushing issues that you wonder whether he was the council person or the 98 official when we were doing rebuild and we were trying to do minority participation, when we were doing the airport deal for the worker unions, you know, the building trades had their own agenda. And so I've been looking at this for a while. And what we're putting together is a list of best practices in other cities. In many cities, they make exemptions for educational policy purposes, right? You know, for, for full-time council members to do some work or they cap the amount that you can own. And there's some disclosure requirements if you get elected and you have your own business, right? So that you can be transparent about what's the intersection between your business interests and the votes that you take. And I think all of those things are timely. And so, you know, I look forward to presenting something um, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm sharing some of those options with my council colleagues now and having a, a discussion in the spring. I think what we heard during this trial is this is necessary. People, you could do outside stuff, but you should need to be more transparent. So, and there's also the issue of what we saw in this trial, which I think is what, you know, the mayor tried to do this whataboutism, which no one, like suggesting that 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 the feds held his buddy to a higher level of scrutiny than, than they hold uh, corporate donors. But what's unique here, it seems to me, was the weaponizing of a city agency and maybe agencies for personal private gain of, 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 an, of someone who's unelected. Um, and so I wonder if there should be, like how many times has l &I been weaponized for private use? Are we, are we to believe it was just the, this, this, th these isolated cases with the, with the, the MRI at CHOP? Like, like how, how endemic was this? And don't we need to investigate that? I was chair of LNI for 12 years. And one of the reasons, you know, some of these interests um, worked very aggressively against me was most of the time I was playing blocker, playing blocker to job descriptions that really wanted to be lined up that way, playing blocker to legislation that were really just jobs bills for particular sectors um, that would really hurt the restaurant businesses and, and other things. So for 12 years that I was at LNI, it was blocking, you know, literally, um, many, many situations. I was involved in, for instance, in the PVC legislation. It took me 11 years to get to the Palmer's Advisory Committee um, in the midst of all of this, you know, and then you see it in the trial where you hear around how they were delaying the PVC bill, which was, we were the last big city not to have PVC, it, you know, uh, decreased $5 a square foot cost. It, you know, it's a conservation component with, for the Comcast deal. Um, I was temporarily appointed to the public property committee for the Comcast deal. So I personally lived and saw some of the line crossing that was going on in what should have been a very public, um, transparent le um, legislative process. So I can tell you that we, um, we need to better align this. And, um, you know, clearly what, what I heard during the, the, the testimony um, I personally lived, um, and I didn't know it was that blatant, right? Because you're not on the phone on those phone calls, but you saw it. Yeah. And this, Larry, this Go goes ahead. right back to the public trust issue and how this plays into why this is so important. When you're weaponizing a city department, when you have access 24 7 to the commissioner of LI, well, my constituents don't have that access. In fact, my constituents complain they can't even get in touch with someone from L and I. Day after day, week after week. So they're holding the bag while 
folks who have political connections, political money, political patrons are able to have access anytime, anywhere. That's a great point. Uh, by the way, you mentioned the, the listening to the phone calls. It really felt like I was eavesdropping on Tony and Silvio at the Bada Bing, right? It, <laughs> it, it felt like you were listening to The Sopranos. It, it was like it, it was like parody, um, and 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 that's why we need this sort of uh, level of transparency. Let me run past you an idea that Sam Katz floated, which you may not like, uh, which is we need to make council uh, expand council to maybe thirty seats and make it a part time body that meets at night in different parts of the city uh, so that we get back to what the charter uh, envisioned, which was a strong mayor system. Um, is there anything to that, Councilwoman? I have mixed emotions around that because I look at the state legislative body and you know, I'll defer a little bit to my colleague. You, know, you have 203 state representatives um, and it, it, as a woman and an activist woman, when, and when we try to get women elected to the state house, we always used to say, you know, that's the ideal part-time job, but it, most of the job goes to, to the sons of the connected, right? People get elected at the state house who, who are very connected. You know, if you want the diversity in terms of women and mothers and other things, we have to take those things into consideration. I do think that, you know, a, a district of 160,000 people, which is what I represent, is, is bigger than most cities and towns in Pennsylvania. So it is a large geography. Um, and I do think there's some merit to having a discussion about making that broader. I know New York has 50 council people um, and the representation is a little bit more, more diverse. But if, you know, who are you trying to draw into into this has to be thought out a little bit, right? Because if not, then you can you can really have a very um, elite group of white men representing who have the privilege to, to be able to do this as a part-time job. Representative Solomon, do you have a, a view on that? On, on, on Katz's proposal? Yeah. Um, I would have to think more on that. I, I, I think that uh, so there's been proposals about the state legislature reducing in size. Um, I think you have to pair that with a commitment to um, fair districting. So you got to get the district right, right, really right. So they're, they're compact. Um, as the councilwoman uh, is talking about, they make sure that Minor, minority in, interests are placed at a premium. They're contiguous. They protect communities of interest. And we really dedicate ourselves to constitutional principles and bring in the public into that process, which we don't have at all in Pennsylvania. So yes, I think I, some of what Sam's talking, I get, get uh, on board with, but it's got to be coupled with a real dedication to uh, redistricting reform and fair districts. Let me ask you both about uh, the, and Maria, you and I have gone, or, gone on or gone around about this, about this, what I think is the scourge of councilmanic prerogative. Um, and I, I, I love, she's in the fight for her life, political life right now, but because she did this, but Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago on day one of her mayoralty signed an executive order you know, you can't, they have aldermanic privilege there. It's the same thing. Uh, uh, you can't uh, legislate a handshake agreement. But what she did was an executive order that, that elevated planning and zoning. Uh, so you can't get something done without real planning and re real input from planning and, and zoning departments. Is that something we should look at here? Because part of Bobby Heenan's uh, power was not just that he was speaking for Doc uh, and, and striking fear in the hearts of people everywhere because of that. But it was also uh, that he had the tacit support of his colleagues to do whatever he wanted to do. It, it, uh, so is there is there something there, Councilwoman? No, absolutely. And we've underfunded our, you know, when Council President Clark created this community planning um, a tier, right, that Ann Fadulin leads, it was, it was to empower and better align some of our planning and zoning and, uh, and, and, and some of the work that we were doing. Unfortunately, what we've seen is an underfunded unit, right? And so what happens is, you know, I am, for instance, in my district, I'm probably 90% um, 
zoned and mapped out, right? The planning commission came out with a zoning code and then the code then has to get mapped into people's districts. And that process is intense. You have to talk to community groups. You know, Representative Solomon will tell you, people will real quick to tell you what they don't want. It's much harder to have a conversation about envisioning what you do want. And I'm like 90% mapped out aggressively pushing and 14 years later. So think about it. So mm. my my newer colleague, someone like Councilwoman Gautier, who's in that, you know, who is a planner by training is going through this process. So I think those departments need to be empowered. They need to be better in line and they need to be better fu uh, um, funded. And that requires council being advised around planning principles and then agreeing on them. I think part of the problem that we have when we talk about bicycle lanes and it becomes controversial is because you have these departments who in isolation are planning neighborhoods and we're not having this broader discussion about connectivity, right? What does it mean? What is, and again, we plan for the money we have, not for what we need. And we're always planning for this year and next and not saying, where are we in 2030, right? Anybody who's doing any planning in the city now should be, what, what does this mean in 2030, 2045? What, does, what are we talking about? And so that lack of connectivity, I call this administration's um, leadership portfolio, um, uh, one based on personalities. When you look at deputy mayors and portfolios, we have become a very isolated, you know, everybody has their lane. And as a district council person, if I'm doing something with departments that are not in those same lanes, if I don't coordinate those discussions, they don't happen. This is the personality portfolio and the right departments are not the ones that are empowered and properly funded. I was remiss in not asking uh, either of you if you've ever taken 98 money and if, uh, and if those who have taken 98 money should now give it back. So I, I took a couple of checks very early on um, and then, you know, it got to a point right early in my in my council career where I sent a check back and I said, look, I don't you know, this this it's not you want to have a relationship with everybody and be able to talk to everybody. And it's taken me years to navigate some of the building trades conversations. Um, and thankfully, many of the other building trade members have learned to work with me through my 12 years um, in council, but the, the cost of the conversation, it was, was not worth it. So I think I took one check um, very early on. Should anyone who's taken it recently give it back? Is that tainted money? Well, you know, I, I do agree that the members and, you know, at one point, I think there were like five Latino electricians and three of them were related to my husband. Right. So I don't want to violate those my nephews who were mem dues paying members from contributing to, to their odd or to anybody. Right. So I, I do think there's a, a separation between the membership who deserves the ability to be represented and deserves the ability to to do what others do at uh, other uh, other unions. I think you know, the way this was wielded and, 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 and people were bullied were, was not the way I would do it, but other, other union members should have the right to participate in the political process. That's a great answer because we'll see what the embezzlement trial uh, uh, results in, but it may just be that the, they might not feel it, but the rank and file may, be, may have also been victims of, mm -hmm. of theft from, it, from the leadership. Uh, Representative Solomon. I did. I mean, I, I think I, I, I took it. I then gave it back after the indictment. Um, I think at least all of us kind of uniting and saying until there's a leadership change, um, we should just hold off. And then when that leadership change happens, re-engage re with 98. I think um, both, both uh, you, Larry, and the councilwoman have, have mentioned the word fear around talking about 98 and John Doherty. And if you read the piece in the Inquirer about how that one juror thought about rendering a guilty verdict, it was a very sad moment, at least when I read it. She said she really was scared about retribution because what she heard on the tapes just evoked this sense of anxiety and fear. That juror represents a lot of us in the city, mm -hmm. we cannot have that type of politics in our city and state. We just can't. That, that's, a, that's a great place to wrap this up. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about these last couple of days is convening 
a public anti-corruption summit uh, where we air these issues. I would invite the, the both of you and also wanna pick your brains about other cities and who's doing this and who, who, who is engaging this issue in a smart, holistic way. Because we've had moments like this before where there's a rush of uh, a couple of reforms and then we go back to business as usual. Um, uh, there was the, you know, under Michael Nutter, there were some reforms uh, 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 related to pay to play and they were good. Um, but we've never really looked at the entire system and maybe this is an opportunity. And so I throw that out there to you if, if you're open to it. Uh, I'd love to do something in a public way that because we, we've got to try and get people to care about this. Uh, so I'd love to I'd love to continue the conversation. No, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And I think, the, you know, again, people are outraged and they need to turn that outrage into accountability for us, the public officials. Right. All of the public officials need to be held accountable and make them take decisions. You know, we have elections coming up in 2002. We have the 2023 election as it relates to council. And this absolutely has to be part of the conversation. So that's an important point you just made. Let me let me just ask you both. Is your sense that your constituents are outraged, but they just don't have a place to put it, or or are they apathetic because it's it's this always happens? I, Larry, you have I both extremes. <laughs> you have both extremes. The people who send you notes and say this is crazy, and then you have the people that say this is why I don't get engaged. Yeah, I, I think Councilwoman's right. I just had a town hall. Uh, two nights ago. Everyone's upset. I, I would say that is the common thread in our politics right now on the Republican and Democratic side. Everyone's pissed off. So let's channel that frustration at our political leaders and our system and let's do some good reforms. That's a great place to end that call to action. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, we'll be back in touch on this uh, topic and thank uh, Thank you all and thank you both and thanks to Citizen Nation for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so thank much. You. Have a good day. All right. all right, thanks guys. Bye. Be in touch.